I'm going to introduce both of our speakers for this session so then they can just get to presenting. Dr. Chloe Slocum is, uh, she is a uh, physiatrist, so uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation. She completed her spinal cord injury medicine fellowship training at Harvard Medical School Department of PM&R, Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital and VA Boston Healthcare System. She specializes in neurological rehabilitation and management of complications that arise from spinal cord injury and neurological disorders. And Joel Lee is a physician assistant in the Department of Urology at MGH. His clinical mission is to provide extraordinary care in all interactions by fostering... <laughs> Uh, by fostering an environment of trust, education, and empathy, which I just love. It's so nice. Um, so thank you both for uh, for being here. And Dr. Slocum, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And we'll do, do both presentations first, and then we'll have Q&A. Definitely. And I, I, I made this sort of a brief presentation, so we have lots of room for Q&A. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I, like um, Shannon said, I am uh, Chloe Slocum, so I practice as a physiatrist. Um, and um, I'm here to talk about a little bit about physical medicine and rehabilitation, how it can help, and how um, yeah, and here and how <laughs> and how PMNR can help with symptom management um, from issues that arise from nerve injury that we see to the spinal cord. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right, I am soft spoken, so if I trail apps in the back. Um, okay. There we go. Okay. So what is PMNR? Um, PMNR is sometimes called physiatry. Um, uh, practitioners are called physiatrists, or sometimes they're called physiatrists. Um, so people sort of differ where they put the inflection, uh, but it's a medical specialty um, that's focused on restoring or maximizing function for a person who's experienced a disability, um, either due to disease, disorder, or injury. Um, PM&R specialists can be found um, at academic medical centers often. Um, they may have subspecialty training in either cancer rehabilitation or in spinal cord injury medicine. Um, and so we'll get a little bit into that. There's also other ways you can find physiatrists. Um, when to see a physiatrist or a, a rehabilitation specialist? Um, it's reasonable to see a rehabilitation specialist really at any time um, following diagnosis, including for what we call sort of quote, prehabilitation um, or postoperatively in the inpatient space um, or also for long-term management in the outpatient clinic space, um, sort of anywhere along that timeline. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about optimal management um, for neuropathic pain um, and for neuropathy symptoms, um, and these can include non-pharmacologic approaches, um, oral medications, um, topical medications, interventional treatments, and possibly surgical consultation. Um, we also have a lot of strategies that we use in the rehab clinic to focus on issues that arise that are medical complications related to nerve injury to the spinal cord, including things like neurogenic bowel, neurogenic bladder, sexual issues, um, skin integrity, mobility, sleep, mood, and health maintenance, sort of optimizing all of these. Okay, so PM&R, if you, if you sort of Google PM&R, um, so it's, Physiatry provides integrated multidisciplinary care aimed at the recovery of the whole person um, by addressing physical, emotional, medical, vocational, and social needs. Um, a doctor who specializes in physical medicine rehabilitation is called a physiatrist. Again, depending on where you are in the country, you could hear someone say physiatrist. Um, same thing. Um, so the physical medicine rehabilitation, um, this is our professional um, organization defining it. Um, aims to enhance and restore functional ability and quality of life um, to individuals with physical impairments and disabilities that affect the brain, spinal cord, nerves, bones, joints, ligaments, 
um, muscles and tendons. Um, so we do a lot of, uh, at least so when I was in medical school, I had a mentor that said, we do a lot of non-operative orthopedics and we do some sort of functional neurology. Um, so we're, we're specialists in nerves, muscles, tendons, um, and impairments that arise from disorders to those. Um, unlike other specialties that may focus on a cure, the goals of the physiatrist are often to maximize functional independence, the activities of daily living, and improve quality of life in a holistic fashion. Um, and so we work with a lot of other disciplines. We work with physical therapists, we work with occupational therapists, we work with a big therapy team, and then we're often working in close coordination with other providers. These could be primary care, these could be oncologists, they could be, could be anesthesiologists, um, but we're, we're we usually get into it, and the people who get into physiatry oftentimes love the team aspect of care. A problem with the sound. Well, so people in the back might be able to hear you. We check, okay. and there is because of the setup of the Zoom, there is no a speak, a microphone for you. <laughs> Forward, I will. I will also try to speak as loud as possible. Okay. You can sit here if you like. You can sit. Of course, of course. Better. I saw Kimberly looking at me so intently. I was like, wrong. Okay. Um, so, so where can you find a physiatrist? Um, I would say uh, cancer centers, especially cancer rehabilitation specialists, are often affiliated with um, cancer centers. So the two biggest fellowship programs um, that are sort of nationally, and it is a growing field. So I don't expect this to stay static, but um, MD Anderson, Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, and then we have cancer specialists here um, at Mass General within the, the Mass General Brigham system as well. Um, they may have specialized programs, interdisciplinary supports, medical and therapy teams, and also peer and family support groups. Um, the other place I would look is the Spinal Cord Injury Model System Centers. There are 18 federally funded sites. Historically, they have focused on traumatic spinal cord injury, um, but they're affiliated with inpatient rehabilitation hospitals um, that are specifically specialized in spinal cord injury care and care of complex spinal cord injuries, which includes a lot of non-traumatic injuries as well, even though their research focus tends to be on traumatic. Um, and I will say that actually we're really excited. Um, the actually the head of the federal agency is presenting at an international conference this month on a pilot to collect data on non-traumatic injuries, which include, um, for instance, um, certain oncologic diagnoses. Um, another place, rehabilitation hospitals, um, they're specializing in rehabilitation. I would ask if they have a spinal cord injury focus. Um, if you're if you're exploring rehabilitation hospitals, not all of them have such a keen focus, um, but uh, many of them may have experience. And of course, if they have spinal cord injury boarded and, and cancer rehabilitation boarded providers that are there, that's, that's really awesome. Okay, so when should I see a rehab specialist? Like I said, it can really be at, at any point along the continuum. Um, there's more and more research being done on what's called prehabilitation um, in terms of looking at optimizing function and optimizing um, someone's physical capacity before they go into, for instance, a surgical setting or an operative setting so that they're, they're in the best shape before they go for the surgery and then their rehabilitation from that benefits from trying to optimize, for instance, their cardiovascular status, um, going into it, um, their, their nutrition, their education, um, and, and just in terms of promoting their mental well-being um, and trying to make sure that they're set up for the best possible outcome afterwards. Okay. So in terms of neuropathic pain, this is something we see really common, commonly. Um, I think in the, for instance, in the traumatic literature, 
And some studies estimate upwards of 80% of people with a traumatic spinal cord injury will have some kind of pain or what we call dysesthesia, which is uh, not, not always uncomfortable, but is an abnormal sensation um, due to the nerve injury. And for this, we sort of think about four different buckets, um, non-pharmacologic approaches um, in terms of things like stretching, exercise, even massage, things like acupuncture, um, physical and occupational therapies, things like mindfulness meditation, supportive therapy, either in a group um, or we you know, even have pain psychology. Um, and then medications, which can be topical, things like topical anesthetics or analgesics, um, oral medications, which can take the form of things like gabapentin, um, pregab, Avalon, duloxetine, there's others, um, even things like, um, if necessary, um, opioid medications, um, and then things that are non-surgical interventions, like nerve blocks or anesthetic injections, um, and then lastly, surgical consultation with pain management. So we really, we try to holistically manage pain through these strategies, and obviously we don't want to send anybody for more surgery right off the bat. Um, but we do want to make sure that if we're if we're exhausting items in the other buckets, that we have a team that we're reaching out to, that we have pain management, and we have people who do interventional treatments that are on board that we can talk to, and we can um, have the have the um, a patient and their their caregivers talk to as well about weighing uh, weighing those. There we go. Okay. Um, so neurogenic bladder, I'm not going to go too deep into this because um, we have um, a Joel here with us, but the, essentially managing neurogenic bladder, we want to get the, we want to be able to empty the bladder and we want to be able to achieve continence. Those are sort of our two bodies. So to make sure somebody is able to effectively empty their bladder, um, because if the bladder is backed up, it can have a detrimental effect on the kidneys, especially long-term. Um, we don't want to injure the kidneys, but we also want people to be dry. We want their skin to be dry. We want them to be comfortable being out, being able to socialize. And we don't want them to start to have, for instance, um, pressure injuries or moisture-related injuries related to incontinence. We often work collaboratively with our urology colleagues. Um, so methods of emptying the bladder. So some people, even after a spinal cord injury, especially more of an incomplete injury, can achieve volitional bladder emptying or just voluntary bladder emptying. Um, if that's not possible, then the next step would be to uh, try to use a catheter, um, either an intermittent catheter um, that is not in the body continuously or something that is indwelling. Um, and we, we really weigh the risks and the benefits and somebody's lifestyle and their preferences um, when we get to that. So there's never one size fits all in terms of a bladder management strategy. It is very individualized. Um, and we, we really work closely with our urologic colleagues to make sure that um, someone has the appropriate intervention and they have um, the device that they're most comfortable with. Um, we will also use, because even if we're using a catheter, sometimes the bladder is still spasming and it's either uncomfortable or it's causing leakage. We will use medications um, to either help the bladder empty more effectively um, or to relax so that it's able to store urine between emptying better without that sort of spasm that's happening between. And then sometimes we'll also use toxins to help relax the bladder. Um, sexual dysfunction in terms of what we call a sacral dysfunction. Um, sexual dysfunction is part of this in addition to the bladder. And so we also manage this collaborative with urology, but this can involve things like medications, devices to improve sexual function, especially erectile function in men. Um, and then additional interventions um, for someone with the right the right age group, or if they're considering um, to, to address male fertility, um, which is especially important um, for folks, I think, who are, who are younger, who may be planning a family um, actively um, when, they're, when they're diagnosed um, or when they're thinking about surgery. So strategies, and then I will say also, we do work sometimes with our urology colleagues on things like sperm banking um, to prepare people if they're going to have radiation in the pelvic field. Um, that is another thing. Um, so neurogenic bowel function, again, when we think of sacral, we think sort of a bladder, bowel, sexual. Um, so for the bowel, um, neurogenic bowel can result in constipation, it can result in incontinence, or it can result in both. Um, the medications we use to improve bowel function 
intervention tend to fall into broad categories, but I really liked, there was a palliative care group in Florida that came up with this, this sort of acronym that I like, which is basically when we're managing bowel, we meant the medications are mush, push, and gush. So mush is school softeners. Um, I know it's kind of, but you can remember it. It's the thing I like. And, 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 and patients, they remember sort of like what falls in what type. So mush, we want something mushy with stool softeners like docusate or colase. Push, these are prokinetic agents. They help the bowel push more effectively. Um, and these can be laxatives like Senna or Senecot. And then another class of laxatives, osmotic laxatives, this is the gush, um, because it draws water into the stool and makes it easier to pass the stool. And these are things like Miralax or polyethylene glycol. Um, and then, um, not in our fun acronym, but um, binding agents like fiber, psyllium, or metamucil. Um, and then I think non-pharmacologic factors that tend to get discounted, but also impact bowel function in a big way. Um, diet, especially intake of fiber and healthy fats. Um, we tend to want people to be on sort of a, a balanced diet. We don't want hugely high fiber. Um, we get sort of nervous if people are on a no, like no fiber. Um, and so we, we want them to be eating a, a balanced diet. Healthy fats can help if people are constipated. Um, things like olive oil, avocados, nuts, that kind of thing. Um, and um, hydration and fluid intake are huge. So if you get behind on your fluid intake, um, you're much more likely to be constipated. Um, and then it can be difficult sometimes. Um, it, it is helpful to track symptoms in a, and maybe treatments in terms of what you're doing or if you had a diet change or you changed a medication in a diary because with the bowel, everything that we're seeing is sort of like a couple of days behind. Um, and so it can be tough to track. And we, we try to counsel people, if you're going to make a change, try to make one change at a time because if you change a whole bunch of things at once, and then something works, you don't really know what worked <laughs> or if it really is bad, then you're, you're not sure like if you don't want to throw out everything because part of that may have been effective um, and it's harder to localize what, what the effect was. Um, and then lastly, um, again, another non-pharmacologic factor that can um, have a big impact is activity or mobility in terms of regular activity. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be running a marathon or walking two miles. It's just sort of getting up, getting walk around, even be, being upright um, is helpful. Um, and I will say this is this is big too, because as, as Joel may talk about, the, the bowel and the bladder affect one another. So if you're super constipated, it's harder to empty your bladder. Um, and so we like to prevent constipation because it's good for the bowel, but also because it's better to empty the bladder. Okay. Um, other things that come up really commonly after um, spinal cord injury um, due to um, due to non-traumatic, oncologic, or traumatic causes, skin integrity is really important to monitor, especially after radiation. So skin, as you ha people have a harder time healing after radiation in the field of radiation. Um, balanced diet and lean protein are really important. Um, weight shifts and regular skin inspections should occur regularly. Um, other things that we'd like to promote, so, if, so this is why I talk about this, if somebody comes in, they say, what should I do to be healthy um, after, after my nerve injury, after my spinal cord injury, after my surgery, um, I say, you know, all of these things medically we want to take care of you. We want to avoid infections. Um, we want to keep you active, um, but we also want to make sure you're sleeping. Sleep can have a really profound impact on mood and lack of sleep can contribute to anxiety and pain, which can then have a big cycle because people get anxious about pain and then they get, you know, the pain is worse and then they get more anxious. And so we try to, you know, have everything be an even keel and try to support people as much as possible so sleep. Um, and so their mood is also better. Um, health maintenance is important to consider. So oftentimes while, while people are in the midst of dealing with a, a catastrophic injury or a really serious diagnosis, um, they might put things in the back burner. And we want to make sure that they're still getting their other cancer screenings, um, trying to promote cardiovascular health and fitness as possible. Um, and then things like bone health, risk of osteoporosis and osteopenia long-term, which we can see in individuals who have more limited mobility. Um, fall prevention, general safety awareness. Um, for instance, if somebody has impaired sensation, we often counsel them, you know, be aware if you spill hot coffee on yourself, if you are cooking, you know, we don't want you to get a burn because you can't feel. Um, and so this is sort of general safety awareness. We want to try to prevent injuries 
that are unintentional and avoidable. Um, access to dental care and oral health is really important. So um, for, for my patients, um, you know, we will talk to them. You know, do you have a dentist? You know, after your injury, if your mobility status changed, you know, is your dentist on the second floor? Do they have a ramp? Do you need to connect with new providers um, that have appropriate accessibility? Um, and then family and community participation and relationships. Um, so I got into rehab because I really like getting people back to the community, back to activities that they enjoy. Um, and uh, I think this is important because everything that we're doing medically is to really help people um, engage with their community, engage in either those social, those family, or those vocational roles that they find so important. Um, and so we want to try to try to get them back to that um, as best we can. Okay, so in closing, um, PNR, PNR physicians, we focus on maximizing independence um, and improving quality of life. Um, where can you find one? You can find one, um, again, academic medical centers, um, spinal cord injury model systems, and then um, they may have subspecialty training in cancer rehab or spinal cord injury medicine, which I think would be really good um, if, if anyone has a diagnosis of chordoma. Um, when you do see one, you can see one at any time. Um, so um, you can see one in the inpatient setting, you can see one in the outpatient setting, either before surgery or afterwards and for long-term follow-up. Um, again, we went over some management strategies for neuropathy and pain symptoms and then strategies for other medical complications that might be related to chordoma. Okay. All right, I'll end and I'll hand it over to Joel so that we can have a Q&A afterwards. Sure. So, hi, my name is Joel Lee. I'm a PA at the Department of Urology at MGH. Uh, it's so nice to meet all of you, and I look forward to speaking after, uh, both for the Q&A and even after them as well. So, in terms of uh, my role here in the presentation, thanks, Dr. Slocum, for really giving a great overview. We have, in urology, we have so much respect for PNR, just, um, just the, some of the really complex needs that people have related with the spinal cord, uh, any spinal cord injury or any uh, illness that or diagnosis that might be impacting the spinal cord. So specifically within urology, I'll just zoom to the side, is that we talk about lower urinary tract symptoms and sexual function or dysfunction regularly. So really in the Q&A and afterwards, feel free to ask anything under the sun. We're, we're, we're happy to talk about it because so many questions come up so regularly. Now with this slide, I just wanted to sort of highlight the complexity, just appreciate the complexity of bladder function. It's like, oh, I'm just urinating, but there's actually a very complex process of, if I just step over here, is that as the bladder fills up from the kidneys and there's fluid going in, sort of the mechanical stretching of the bladder, there's a complex process that turns it into electrical signals Electrical signals get wired through the spinal cord into the brain. The brain processes that and then they send it back out. And then you get this mechanical action of emptying. So multi-step, multi-step shorts. And here's just a brief picture of the difference of anatomy, uh, highlighting the difference between male and female anatomy, especially of the lower urinary tract. One in the bottom pictures here, you're, you see that there's a lot of things that are in close proximity. Uh, as Dr. Slocum mentioned, why bladder and bowel, uh, bladder and bowel are, are, uh, can really impact each other uh, because there's been some theories saying that it's because of the close proximity or neighborhood of the two organs together. But what we realize is that actually brain, spinal cord, bladder, bowel, and our sexual organs as well all follow the same nervous tracks down to those organs. And so whenever there's one issue in one side, it can really impact the issues of the other. So optimizing 
all of them is, is very valuable and important. The other piece too is the difference between the male and female lower urinary tract. Uh, the big key is that for females, there's only one sphincter. Uh, the pelvic floor muscles do play a role in helping people stay dry or stay incontinent. Uh, but for males, they have two sphincters and there's the prostate as well, which can help people stay dry. So often we find that for females, especially females who have given birth, where the pelvic floor muscles have been stretched uh, or maybe even injured through the birthing process, that females can tend to become a little bit more incontinent where they end up leaking a little bit more urine. Where males typically don't have that issue, but because the prostate is also involved in helping you stay dry for males, uh, often we see the opposite where it, uh, being able to empty is a little bit more difficult. Now, in terms of function, what happens is that our bladder, 99% of the time, is just a storage container. It's just collecting fluid from our kidneys. And then once sort of there's that stretch that I talked about and the communication between the brain and the spinal cord and bladder, uh, it reaches this one percent time of being able to empty. And so we call we've broken this down in urology in two phases. The 99 percent of time we call it the storage phase, where it's just our container. And then the one percent of the time, there's an avoiding phase. And so when we see bladder dysfunction is that we think about, is the issue with the storage? Is there some issue with the 99% of the time where the bladder might be too sensitive or not sensitive enough? Uh, and then the other side of it too is when the bladder is emptying, is there an issue of how, uh, is there some issue of how it might be too weak or there might be some outlet issue as well? And particularly anything that can impact that communication pathway again, in this case, in our topic today of spinal uh, sacral nerve chordoma, is that that can really impact how the nerves uh, will allow conduction and communication channels between the bladder, spinal cord, and brain. Now, when we think, I actually want to just zoom forward to this slide before talking about the visit. Uh, just appreciating too about sexual function as well, is that I mentioned earlier that there, that the nerve channels control bladder function and bowel function and sexual function are all tied together, going through the same track. Uh, and, and we just see sort of also too within sexual function that there's many complex pathways as well. Uh, the neurogenic components of sexual function can include libido, arousal, reaching orgasm for males, it can be erections and ejaculation as well. So uh, that's why that's all part of our conversation. Now, when you come in for a visit, uh, one of the ways in which we recommend of thinking about how you prepare in urology is, especially if urinary symptoms are your most bothersome issues, uh, to do what's called a three-day voiding diary. Uh, a three-day voiding diary is very simple, where over the course of 72 hours, you just keep really good track of your intake, so how much fluids you're drinking in, your output, you measure how much you're emptying, and then also the frequency. So that's why there's that timetable there of when you are going to the bathroom and when you are drinking. Additionally, too, when we are concerned or there are symptoms of like leaking or incontinence that bothers us, uh, there's a space for us to just mention that of when it's occurring, how much is occurring, and whether or not we need to use any type of incontinence supplies like pads or uh, the adult briefs. Now, the other part of preparing for a visit with us is just making sure that you gather your lab tests and imaging results, thinking about your symptoms. Sometimes with urinary symptoms, they show up really early, even as early in childhood. So going as far back as possible can be very helpful for your visit. And then finally, just bring your medication list and writing down any medications that you may have tried. Uh, and then when you come into our when you come into our office, uh, we recommend that for what you might expect is to come in with full bladder so that you can provide a urine sample. Uh, and then we do a couple things. We might do a, a, a two or three things. The first is this is just um, an image of what a urine sample does. Is that we get to we literally dip this piece of paper into the urine and get to evaluate the chemistry to say is there some issue within the contents of the urine that 
will help us understand more about both the urinary, lower urinary tract, the bladder, and uh, the emptying mechanisms, or even the upper urinary tract as well, like the kidneys. We also will evaluate at times flow rate. Uh, how I mentioned earlier that sometimes there are outlet issues that make it difficult for the bladder to empty. So this here is a Euro uh, flow meter where all you do is instead of urinating a toilet, you urinate in this device. And we can really track to see the volume and the speed in which you're able to empty. And that can give us some very helpful information of what might be going on. And then this here is just showing that when you come in, we want to see what is the leftover volume in your bladder after you have emptied. So I've marked the X there to say, this is where the bladder is. And we'll use an ultrasound device to be able to see and look what is the total volume. So again, more clues. These are just tools that we can know uh, if there's issues with the voiding, the storage phase of the storage container or the voiding phase of how you are emptying. Additionally, too, we will, um, during the time, we'll just, we'll have a very extensive discussion. A lot of times in neurology, it's really about the history of what has been going on, how much, and the objective pieces of uh, what are the most bothersome symptoms. Highlighting the piece that we really are trying to figure out how we can help you to have the best quality of life possible. Uh, particularly if uh, sexual symptoms are also a concern or something that is really plaguing your quality of life, a physical examination will be involved. Uh, and then the final piece is that during your visit, uh, we sometimes talk about next steps and just giving a very brief overview of what some of those next steps might be. Uh, often it can be very conservative of just lifestyle management. Uh, at times too, we may recommend medications. And then the third piece, which I'll highlight in a couple minutes is just there's a more comprehensive test to again, help us understand the ways in which the sacral chordoma might be impacting the bladder, spine, and brain communication. Uh, very briefly, just some universal tips that we can offer that I just threw on the slide here. Uh, but when we think about lifestyle modifications, uh, Dr. Slocum mentioned about fluid intake being very critical, and especially for the bladder with relating to function and preventing urinary tract infections, and also how you even feel uh, fluid intake is very critical and also very critical for bowel management as well, too. So we recommend drinking 64 to 80 ounces of water. We think about fluids that can cause what's, what's called mild diuresis, meaning making the kidneys work a little bit harder and drawing fluid from your body, which is hydrating you and just dumping it into the storage container of the bladder. So we talk about these three fluids, particularly about coffee, tea, or alcohol. And then we think about function, too, and especially if a part of the diagnosis of chordoma might impact sensation, we talk about almost potty training of uh, encouraging to empty on a regular interval. So that way the bladder doesn't get so stretched out because as we think about the bladder as a mechanism that stretches and fills and then empties, sometimes when you over distend the bladder where it stretches too much, too much, it becomes what's called urinary retention where you are just so stretched out that you're not able to empty that volume. And our hope is to prevent that as well. And then also just being mindful of habits around bedtime as well. Uh, sometimes nighttime symptoms are the most bothersome symptoms and that itself has its own complex process of many pieces involved. Uh, and then just a word about medications too. Uh, why I mentioned earlier about breaking down the storage phase and the voiding phase is that the medications we have in our toolbox uh, think about the ways in which they impact the nerves that impact storage or voiding. And so we have several medications on both sides, uh, on both components that can hopefully help you out, either to help calm down, for example, help you calm down an overly sensitive bladder or help the bladder more empty more completely or help you feel more completely empty as well. And then this slide here, I just wanted to pause of what I mean by extra testing. In your urology, we have this neat test called a urodynamic study. And essentially, this is a test that can really help us understand your lower urinary tract function as it relates to um, a neurologic diagnosis like sacral chordomas, which is we really see with physics, volume, pressure, flow, resistance. And what's involved in this test, I, this is just a little cartoon, is, this is what the setup looked like. 
But as you see, sort of this fluid bag that's hanging is that we are really mimicking to, we're trying to mimic to see what happens as one, the bladder fills up all the way until it's very full and sort of what are the sensations that you're having throughout that time. And then once you reach that point where you say, I've got to go, I've got to go, have you empty. And we're able to really evaluate along that whole track to see what is happening and also be able to be guided by how we might be able to help you best. Uh, additionally, too, not pictured here is that there's something called video urodynamics that you might hear about, uh, especially if you Google the word urodynamic, which is basically we'll be able to take images um, concurrently as the bladder is filling up and then as you empty. Uh, just some practical pieces is that this feels or this can look very intense. Um, thankfully, this test is a very short study. It's about 15 or 20 minutes. And uh, after that time, we get a lot of very helpful data. Uh, and then you just go home and you're able to go home and be fine. Uh, so, and then with sort of these, this overview of possible next steps, I just want to say that, you know, even if you choose one or the other, uh, it, managing, especially urinary function that's impacted by a neurologic diagnosis is very complex and does take steps, trial and error, does take review and management and checking in as well to see how, how people are doing to know that, you know, even if we're helping the numbers, but we're really improving the quality of life. So just know, just more as an encouragement, that's what the slide is for, that there will always be follow-up as long, you know, as long as you're working with us, we'll want to follow up with you. Um, and then going back to this slide about sexual function, uh, there's just all those components, uh, uh, all those components impacted, um, where the brain, spine, and the sexual organs uh, can really impact uh, arousal, libido, orgasm, and erection, ejaculations. And so there are just different components of management as well. I'm, I'm glad Dr. Slocum also brought up fertility because that is very much a part of urology as well. And depending on what are the symptoms, uh, how it's impacting your personal life, uh, there are just so many different nuanced ways in which we might be able to help you out. Uh, so that's just an overview of what urology does and sort of really highlighting more uh, both the urinary and sexual function management. And just in terms of ever looking for, if you are truly interested in finding a urologist, it, it's just quite simple. There's urology offices throughout the country and throughout each state uh, where you just get a your referral and particularly related with uh, sacral chordomas. Uh, you want to find a urology team that subspecializes in what's called neurourology. Uh, these are teams that can understand how your neurologic diagnosis impacts the lower urinary tract and sexual function as well. Um, and then just as a plug for my team as well is that uh, myself and the physician I work with, his name is Dr. Pablo Gomery. Uh, he's a neurourologist who's been practicing for 40 plus years. Um, you, you're always welcome to join us if you're, you're in Boston. Uh, so thank you very much. Move these chairs over so we can see who has the Q&A. A little bit more. This is perfect. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yes. There we go. And the mics are at the table so people can hear you guys when you ask questions. Oh, that's good. Okay. Awesome. Fire away with questions. <laughs> so, Mr. Lee, uh, you mentioned about the possibility of overextending bladder. So, sometimes I notice that overnight I my bladder has over a thousand ml. Now, how do I know if my bladder is overextending? Is that a way I can perceive that? Great question. Sorry, what is your name? Carlos. 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 Great. Great question. So, in terms of, uh, there's a very common question where people say, "What is normal? So, what is the average? Am I above average, below average, or am I kind of average?" 
And really in urology, especially with aging, I think just getting older, uh, all the medical conditions that people can go through in their life, the environmental factors, we've just found that as people get older, by the time you're 80 years old, you are so different from 95% of every other 80 year old. So, um, so, so just to answer some of reassurance is that, um, is that certainly there's not a specific piece of saying you are definitely over descending or you're not over descending. That's where the evaluation is a very key component. Uh, what I would really recommend is, is saying that if you're feeling that there are symptoms where you are having difficulty urinating, or you feel like you're really struggling or pushing, or your sleep is being very disrupted, uh, for sure, that, that by all means means go to see a urology team to be able to help you out and really see more of the underlying what's going on. Uh, I highlighted too early the three-day diary, where actually as we get older, there's this thing, there are a couple of hormones in our system where when we're little babies, we produce urine all in the daytime, and then as we get older, those hormones shift, and then we start producing urine more in the evening. So it's not very surprising at all when you say, well, I'm urinating one, 1 1.5 liters overnight, like the total volume overnight. In the daytime, maybe I'm getting like 800. That's just part of natural physiology of aging. Um, so what is really helpful in urology is that not only to get the total volume, but each time you urinate, we're very curious what are the, the volumes that you're getting with each urination as well. And that's where the three-day voiding diary might be helpful. So did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. I don't know if other people are different than I am, but if this state of surgery with the nerves all being cut, I cannot have a diary. I don't know when I'm going. I don't know when I'm stopping. It's continuous. And I have a physiatrist. What are maybe some more drastic things that can be done when you really are not normal? You're not um, able to control that. Oh, thanks for sharing that. And what is your name, too? Donna. Donna, thanks. Thanks for just you know your direct your direct question. Just sort of really sharing what you're dealing with. Uh, how long have you been sort of dealing with these symptoms for? 11 years. Wow, wow. Like, that's really, that's really impacting you. And I mean, I've had Botox, so I've taken mesotomies. Um, there's really nothing that I that I had mm. that, you know, works other than it's just, that's really cool. I mean, that's, that's the way it is. So I couldn't tell. Uh, I couldn't measure anything. No, no, and, and that can be true too. It's like maybe other people. And the odd thing is, for the sacral people, my understanding is that most are self-tapping. When I was in the hospital, they were teaching me to do that, and then all of a sudden, you know, in the midst of this training, I started going. So I think I'm unusual in that. I'm not self-tapping, but now I just have no. The side, you're just leaking, yeah, yeah uncontrollably. Uh, and 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 I appreciate your question and just bringing up sort of your specific case is that one I would say is that it really does highlight that you know there's the sacral cord ones that we know generally same thing like I threw up three day voiding nerves like oh do a three day voiding nerve very general information, but as we see too is that. The way we, we all, because of all those nerves that are going that innervate and sort of those really complex pathways that impact bladder function, which nerves are being affected can really change how the bladder itself is working as well too. Additionally too, uh, each person has possibly other medical issues or other surgeries. Um, for example, like we, I'm just thinking specifically of people who may have had complex deliveries, you know, when they delivered a child, that can also really impact bladder function. And on top of any type of neurologic diagnosis, you get a very, very complex and very nuanced way of looking about bladder function. Um, all, all that to say really is that, um, Donna, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to just sort of, it, it just sounds like you've been dealing with this, with this for 11 years. I'd be more than happy to talk with you and say, if, if you'd like for us to, see you or help you out or at least try to talk, you know, see what else might be done. I, I'd certainly be happy to do that. 
So, but thanks, thanks for your question though. Can you explain, um, so uh, on behalf of my husband, who is not here, and he's a lumbar patient, actually, um, but he has the uh, neurogenic bladder at night, so he may be up 12, 15 times at night mm -hmm. during the day. It doesn't happen during the day, although it takes him a long time to empty his bladder during the day, but at night. So can you explain what, 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 is, what triggers that? Yeah, absolutely. So... Nighttime symptoms are really are, are really nuanced, like I mentioned earlier, because one is there's certainly the bladder, there's a neurogenic bladder component in the part where there's some dysfunction of the bladder and its communication pathways. Uh, so that's one component. And the second component, too, is thinking about the hormonal changes. That's why I brought up about the sleep uh, being babies versus as we get older, where what we drink for fluids can also really impact uh, our sleep. Uh, additionally, sleep quality and how well we are sleeping can also impact and cause us to wake up. So all of those things might be happening concurrently at the same time too. Uh, so in terms of in terms of just practical strategies to try for nighttime symptoms, is 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 being uh, is certainly being aware of uh, the fluid intake uh, right before bedtime. That because we know that as we get older, our urine production is shifting towards nighttime. A really good rule of thumb is make sure you are one really well hydrated during daytime, uh, but stopping any fluid intake about five or six hours before bedtime. And then the third too is that if the bladder is really struggling to empty over a 24 hour period, to do what I, you know I mentioned earlier about this bladder training. Make sure that even if you either don't feel like going or you just feel a little discouraged that during daytime you're just producing little bits but you're training your bladder and helping it be less stressed by going every couple hours. It's, it's almost, it really sounds silly. It almost sounds like potty training, like potty ch training a child or a toddler, but it is just that is that we're helping the bladder relearn, you know, what is an adequate volume and making sure that it's never going beyond a certain volume for each individual person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, have, I had my surgery a year ago, and I've been doing a PT, physical therapy, uh, on and off throughout the year, mostly uh, pelvic floor kind of therapy. Uh, I haven't seen much of a change in the way I use catheter, otherwise nothing goes, comes out. And I have to use suppository at night. Do you think I should continue on? When, when is the point where you can see, okay, there is no point in doing this PT anymore? Is there a time when you can trace that line? I think so. A lot of, a lot of, but with PT, I think we think about it in terms of are there, if there are things that you're doing, um, what is your goal with PT? And if the goal is, if the goal is to get totally back to normal, and it might not be totally normal, you know, like, but there might be an improvement, you know, what would the improvement goal be? Um, and working towards that. Um, I think it's tough too, because the, the nervous system is so different than a lot of the other body systems. Um, you know, if you, if you get a cut or you break a bone or you have a burn, like there are sort of a window where like, if you're eating normally and you're, you know, you have normal metabolism, we can tell you you'll heal by this time, right? Like a bone, you know, you, there's a time when they take out the cast, they don't just leave it on forever. Um, but with the nervous system, it's tough. It, you know, it heals more slowly. <laughs> And then the degree of healing too, there's a there's more uncertainty that we have than with some of these other systems. And so with with that, in terms of it, some people use a suppository and catheter and they use it for many years. So I want to say neither of those is, is harmful to keep using. Um, but if you were to say, you know, well, um, I'm not seeing anything with public core therapy, and I 
can I stop it? You know, or is there a window where it's going to be really beneficial? And I don't want to stop it. I think we we tend to think um, in the traumatic literature, it's imperfect extrapolation, but the sort of if you're a year out, sort of within two years, you know, there's there's more quieting of you know edema and things like that that were around the surgery, um, and and probably that's a it's a good baseline. But we still can see anecdotally people make changes and make improvements after that. So I would say if you wanted to continue to that point, um, as long as you have goals that you're working towards, that would be helpful. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, as far as mobility, now I'm not getting any younger, but um, with say from S two uh, down, all gone, um, and and I I also have hip replacement, but that's something else. But I, I but for the past years, if I'm walking a long distance, um, I have to use a cane. Is yes. it does it? It's, is it feasible to think that that could improve or with that amount of, uh, you know, of nerve damage that this is something that I just have to live with? Um, you might. I mean, there's all kinds of, I didn't include very much my physician. We get all excited about sort of assistive devices, different kinds of, mm -hmm. of, of you know, gadgets and things like that. But the, um, you 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 might have some improvement. I, I think the other thing to keep in mind too is that even if even if sort of we take the neurologic component out of it, people can make really big gains just from their other medical issues being well managed or you know improving. Um, so we notice this like for instance with sleep apnea. Sometimes people with sleep apnea they feel really miserable, they're tired, headache. And once we you know they may also have a spinal cord injury. Once we treat their sleep apnea, I'm like they're ready to go out and exercise, like they're just feeling much better. Um, so I think the you you might have some improvement where you are able to not use the cane, yeah. um, or um, you might want the cane for stability, or you could do something like we um, my favorite thing, um, and it's like hiking poles or the trekking poles, okay. kind of like ski poles. As soon as we recommend those to people, even if they aren't using a cane sort of day to day, especially if they're traveling or they're walking a longer distance and they know that they're going to feel fatigued at the end it's of It's a long distance. So I, I go to the gym. I do like as, as much as I can. And it's balance as yep. that, that figures into it. Yep. And so the, the trekking poles are really nice for balance because they give you sort of support on both sides. And they're, you know, not to not to be stigmatizing, they're a little sportier looking sometimes than a cane. Um, and so sometimes people prefer them for that reason. Yeah. We're able, we're able to get people on board whereas, you know, before they were like, oh, I don't want to use that yeah. medical. Thank you. Yeah, Shin. Um, the, Joel, so Joel, you talked a little bit about schedules for urination. And we've heard from a number of patients that schedule for bowel is super important as well as really just um, to get things under control. So there minimizes accidents or even, you know, gets rid of them. Can you, I guess, Dr. Slocum, can you talk a little bit about bowel management? Um, yes. So a schedule for bowel is also super important. I think we want people in the hospital, we tend to want people to move their bowels at least once a day. Um, certain folks, especially with the, the lower sacral levels, will, we will encourage them to even try twice a day um, if they have what's called lower neuron bladder where the sphincter is flaccid. Um, and so that way they're preventing any accidents. Um, for some people, it's just that's too much. Um, and so they'll scale back. I think we get nervous when we hear things like, I move my bowels once a week. Like that, that's, yes, like that not actually going on. Um, I think um, we have some people that do like do three times, so like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I, I think the goal is, again, to, to make sure that people are, are not feeling uncomfortable and to make sure that they're content. Um, and so we, we will try to, again, we do a lot of diaries and tracking, um, similar to urology, but I think with the, with the bowel, another important thing is that, um, 
we're with our diet, sort of sometimes it varies so much. So people's diets in hospitals sometimes are very different than what they're eating at home. And then just being aware that sometimes you might have triggers, um, trigger an accident. So it's not something that like you did or some med medication, um, but it could be, you know, that like if you eat a particularly oily meal or you go out to eat and it's a much bigger portion than you're usually eating, like then that might trigger something where your, your bowel all of a sudden is sort of, it wants to go earlier or you like have an accident. Um, and so keeping that in mind. Um, and then I think we do, um, you know, for people where their, their bowel is just unmanageable, you should work with people quite intensively and in trying to get a good bowel program down. But um, if, if it's really something that they're, you know, they've, they're spending three or four hours a day on bowel and it's really their participation in other life activities. Um, so we've tried all our medications and we've tried all of our, our gadgets um, that, you know, then we'll have them talk, you know, is it time to start thinking about an, like an ostomy? Um, and that can sound like a really extreme change, but sometimes it's, people love it because it's just much more controlled and the period they're spending four hours, predictable and they're having accidents. Now it's, you know, it's very self-contained and you know, they don't have to worry about travel or schedules or like that. Because so for people who have been struggling and are kind of at that point, like you said, if it's been a while and still just really not manageable, um, would so they could seek out a podiatrist to start the like just to start talking about bowel. Yes. But then it would be a colorectal or a gastroenterologist, or where would they start to, to kind of say, what I'm doing now isn't working. What's my next steps? Yeah. I think we see a lot of people about bowel. So as I actually, we see a lot of folks about bowel for um, a gastroenterologist. Our gastroenterology colleagues also see um, a lot of folks. Um, and so specifically, if, if somebody is a motility specialist, um, oftentimes they will have some experience in the way neurologic injuries affect the bowel. So a medical gastroenterolo gastroenterological utility specialist. Um, and then if somebody really is thinking about colostomy, then either a, a general surgeon, a colorectal surgeon, um, or... Okay. And if they don't really know who to start with or where to start with... Start. Okay. And um, I think for something that sort of required a rare diagnostic test, I would go with like the GI specialist. And they're definitely up to down on medications. And sometimes they're very cutting edge medications they're trying. Um, but physiatry is a good place to start, definitely. Um, because we can help think through the whole process and ask, ask about some of these contextual factors in the time course. Right, yeah. I've heard, I've heard you refer to sort of as like quarterbacks that you can take the person and say, what's going on here? And then go to this person, go to that person, you know, to kind of gather a team around. We are, we are. I will sometimes my patients list me as their PCP. We, we, we are kind of, we are kind of a PCP for all things spinal cord injury related. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we. You know, I don't, I don't manage like complex heart medications or somebody's diabetes, but we will manage like basically all systems aspects of, uh, of, uh, of spinal cord injury. And, and I'm that means close collaboration. With close our, collaboration. Our, yeah, right, right. Yeah, because I, I mean, I may know that you need your dynamic testing, but I would be the one to do it. Yes, right, okay. And Dr. Slocum, can I follow up on that question? Because I think in your first slide, you said, Physiatrists are located at academic centers. Yeah. So if you're not near such a center, where do you go? Um, do you go directly or? I would say, I mean, you can look in your hospital, your local hospital directory or your health system because they're, they're not just at big academic centers, but cancer rehab specialists might be more common here. Um, Spinal cord injury specialists, honestly, are, are you know, spread out. Um, proportionally, they tend to be more academic medical centers, but they're not exclusively there. Um, and so I would just start and look for a physiatrist. And if you find a physiatrist, you can um, 
you can call them up and just ask what they specialize in um, because they are different. We have colleagues in sports medicine and things like that. So a sports medicine doctor might not be the person to talk to about neurogenic bowel. Um, but um, you know, certainly there there are physicians outside of academic cell. Thank you. And from what I understand, someone who specializes in spinal cord injury is a person for chordoma patients, even if it's not a spinal cord injury because the results are the same if nerves are cut or, or missing, that there's... That's correct. And in fact, we often refer to sort of a, what we call non-traumatic injury, mm -hmm. um, which can result from chordoma, result from surgery, it can result from uh, you know, um, anything that is not traumatic, I mean, that more people accident, uh, a traumatic injury. And really, the results are because of the nerve injury. Um, and so, spinal injury specialists fully specialize in that. Um, and many spinal injury specialists, a lot of our treatment patients today, also have experience with certain other conditions that directly affect the spinal cord, like multiple sclerosis and the nail. Yeah, I didn't have any trouble finding a physical medicine doctor. I just, and I see him every two months, and he kind of oversees everything else. I haven't seen the urologist yet, and you know, you have her on the scan and sends me for PT spray, and I don't want. But I just started after looking on my insurance and seeing that's a great idea. <laughs> who was in that field of physical medicine and rehabilitation. And I picked somebody. I didn't have, you know, just I didn't know. It was after two years, and I was kind of plateaued off. And uh, and and I and then I don't live in a rural area. I'm outside of Philadelphia, but you know, there were several New Jersey. It wasn't it wasn't real difficult. Yes, we are blessed in the Mid Atlantic and the North. I would say if you're if you're a rural, you're like in rural Alabama. It's probably a little bit, deeper. and I know our colleagues in Houston take care of a big catchment area because they're from like West Texas over to Alabama. But they, like in those systems, and I will say too, if you're in the Northwest, there are specific systems, especially through like medical medical education, where they may have a collaborative network set up. So I know like the our physiatry colleagues in Seattle actually take care of patients in Alaska but they have a whole telemedicine system uh, that is set up through the, the training programs in the medical there. Um, and so they provide care to individuals with spinal cord injury that are in quite remote areas. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. This has been really informative and helpful, I think. And uh, thanks for all the questions from the, from the participants. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so now it's time to move on to sessions two and three. So check your agendas for uh, the options there and decide which one you want to go to.